welcome to this live from Zero Waste Leads as part of the lead, their Fashion Futures campaign. I'm Peg Alexander, the Leads-based journalist and presenter. Basically, I get people to talk for a living and I've also been around the campaign for our climate for over 30 years. And a little secret, originally I trained to be a fashion designer. So there we go, something a bit close to my heart. Now, working alongside the uh, Royal Society for Arts, of course, Zero Waste Leads are exploring what we can do as a city to minimise the negative impacts of our clothing choices. They're looking at a range of themes, including what influences our choices on clothing, how we buy our clothes, how we look after them, how we dispose of them. Very, very pleased that this morning we are talking to Leeds University's Dr. Mark. Mark Sumner. We're going to discuss the true cost of fashion. After 15 years in the retail industry, he now focuses on sustainability within textile, clothing and fashion. We're thinking about those questions. How can we rethink our fashion choices and why should we? What are the carbon and human impacts of clothing production uh, and what could be our fashion futures here in Leeds. We also have, as always, our very own Jill Coupland here from Zero Waste Leeds to join in the conversation. So now, now that we are live and now that we are get going, let, let's kind of kick off, Mark, with are you able to sort of give us the headlines really of, of kind of what the impact of the clothing industry is around uh, carbon and sustainability? I'll, I'll try to, Peg, and thanks very much for uh, getting us online. I know it's been a bit of a struggle to, to get there. Um, so when we think about fashion, when we think about the clothing industry, um, it, it's quite easy to forget that every human being on the planet is wearing clothes and will have more than one set of clothes in, in, in most cases. And, it, and it's also very easy to forget that the clothing industry has been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And we often talk about the clothing industry as an industry, but actually it's an industry of industries spread across the globe. So we have agriculture producing things like cotton and wool. We have heavy industry producing yarns and fabrics. We have a chemical industry that is there providing the, 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 the chemicals to dye the fabric, to give the colors that make the fashion industry so, so um, uh, exciting. Of course we have um, consumers buying these the, the, the clothing from 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 vast vast international um, retail um, organizations we have hundreds and thousands of tons of clothing being washed in washing machines every day and of course at end of life when someone decides that that garment is no longer for them those garments are disposed and the choices we make as individuals will determine whether that ends up in landfill or whether that garment gets a second or third life and when we put all that together across the whole planet and recognizing, you know, that there are 7 billion people living on the planet, we can then see that the fashion industry, the clothing industry is going to have massive impacts. And, and yes, very much associated with climate change and carbon release into the atmosphere from the energy, energy use associated with the industry. But there's massive amounts of, of water consumption, but also water pollution. So it's not just about extracting the water and use it, it's also about the fact that we're, we're polluting water courses. There are issues around um, biodiversity, deforestation. There are issues um, associated with the human aspect of, of sustainability, bonded labor, forced labor, child labor. And because the fashion industry is so global, is so huge, is a combination of lots of different industries, it's, it's not surprising that the industry is connected with all of these issues. But I guess the, 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 the important thing and, and the thing that we, we should always do when we have these sort of conversations is balance that up. There are 300, at least 300 million people employed in developing nations um, and, they're, and they're being paid and they're being brought out of poverty as a result of working in garment factories, working in cotton fields that drive the industry. So it's always important to balance up the, these issues. The, the, the critical thing that I talk about in terms of sustainability is, are the bad things that the industry are doing, do they outweigh the good things that the industry delivers? So where, where, where do you go and give us, give us your sort of very quick analysis then on, uh, on, on that balance? And, and, and I think, you know, uh, like every other industry, like every other sector, like every other activity that we all have as humans, there are too many bad things going on that completely outweigh the positive impacts we get. Now, if, if you were to say to me, what are the numbers, Mark? I'd have to say to you, Peg, I don't know what the numbers are because no one really knows how big the issues are. Um, 
there is an estimate that potentially up to 8% of global CO2 uh, emissions are associated with all of these industries that contribute to the fashion industry. But the reality is, it, it's really hard to say exactly what those impacts are because of the complexity of the industry. And also carbon footprint of a garment is also associated with what you as a consumer do with the garment. So that also adds to that complexity. Yeah, just to say, we have got people watching us on Facebook. So please do join in the discussion. I've got it open here. I'm keeping an eye. So if you've got any questions, got any comments, any thoughts, feed them in and, and we'll bring them into the discussion. I mean, it feels to me that that's one of the most interesting things about uh, this whole question is that often the, the question of climate change, of what we do to become more carbon neutral can feel too big for people. But actually when it comes to fashion, right, this, this in some ways is quite little because it is a question of, am I gonna buy that top? Am I, am I not gonna buy that top? And if I do buy that top, uh, how many times we're going to wear it and how many times we're going to wash it. Um, Jill, you got such debate going, didn't you, on the fa on, on social media this week about the fact that you don't wash your hoodies, but you stick them out on the line. Yeah, and it is funny, isn't it? I think it, what you said there is, is, is right. You know, some of the things, some of, some of the climate change issues feel so big, but actually when it comes to fashion, there are lots of things that, that we can all do and that's why one of the reasons we we're interested to speak to Mark was to try and get more people to understand the carbon footprint of the clothing that we buy and then we can um, we can respond to that so we can do things like um, not buy as much wear our stuff more um, swap exchange buy second hand but one of the themes in Leeds Fashion Futures, the project that we're doing with the RSA, is about valuing our clothes. And, how, and, and part of that is how we look after them. So the yeah, massive advocate, the thing is about washing your clothes is that's a job of work to do, washing, drying, ironing. A lot of the stuff is a, it's a bad habit. Ironing, sorry, sorry, my brain know, didn't excuse what you've just I said. I quite like I'm, so, <laughs> quite Sorry, like you've just said well, you know, we haven't we hit a point where we don't have to do completely unnecessary things and ironing is exactly. But that's exactly it. And one of the things we can do is change the wash basket habit that when you, you know, you're getting into your pyjama at the end of the day, sling everything in the wash basket. It's just not necessary. Obviously, some stuff gets dirty. It needs washing. And some people have jobs where they need to wear clean clothes every day. But... You can just refresh your stuff by pegging it out on the line, even in this weather. So I posted a, a picture of my jumpers that I'd pegged out on the line. They didn't need washing. They just needed a refresh. They came in smelling lovely. That My hoodies were just cooking smells, just needed to get rid of the smell. They didn't need a wash. So there are lots of in in things that we can do as individuals that, that will have an impact. And that's, that's, what, you know, that's exactly what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, which, it, which is just so great because it, it is something that we can all do. I mean, before we started this conversation, Mark, I mean, one of the things we were saying, though, kind of, a, so we've said, you know, actually, in some ways, it's quite small, there's things we can make. As you were saying, though, part of this is that the, the, the picture out there is really big. And one of the things we were saying just before we came live is that your work is a real mixture of looking at everything because you're looking at supply chains, you're looking at subcontracting, you're looking at how uh, uh, imports and exports work all over the world. It's also a question about psychology. It's a question of technology. It's a question of science. <laughs> you know, I mean, almost everything's thrown into this whole thing about the fashion industry, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, and, and, and you know it's, it's completely um, it, it, inherent. It, it's completely part of, of human society, and 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 where we start from uh, when we're talking about fashion and trying to come up with solutions for sustainability, we start from this premise of what what is the job? What does fashion actually do? And you know, I, 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 in many ways, I, I would argue that you know, fashion can be seen as really quite facile. You know, this this whole thing about the latest fashions, the latest trends, the latest fads, um, and and. And personally, I think that, that that can be quite facile, as, as I say. But actually, the job that fashion does is, is from a psychological point of view, is, is, is huge. It's fast. It is the most um, powerful non-verbal communication device that we have as as individuals. We say a huge amount about what about who we are, who we associate with, who we don't associate with. I mean, you know, what what does pink hair say about us all? So you know, we, we that 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 communication that that we have from our clothing is vitally important as, as we are social animals. 
So when we talk about how we resolve some of the issues uh, associated with the production and use and disposal of fashion, we have to think about why uh, we have fashion and what the job that fashion does. So when you start from that point, um, the, the idea that a solution to sustainability, sustainability is to say, stop buying clothes. Well, that, that is a theoretical solution, but it ignores that psychological need that we all have for wearing clothes. And this is not wearing clothes just to keep us dry and keep us warm. It's about positioning our status within society. It's about saying who we are and what we do. And, and particularly uh, um, really important for um, younger uh, people as, as they sort of create their, their identity and, create their, and, and start to build ideas around self-esteem, for example, clothing plays an important role in that. And, and you know, that, that has actually, over the past few years, become really important as, as the growth of social media and Instagram and, and have, how we project ourselves through the, these channels. The clothes we wear provide opportunities for other people to either compliment us or, unfortunately, um, you know, it, it say, say not so complimentary things about us. So that, that, that's the starting point for all of the work we do. We, we, we will not start from this position of saying, just stop buying clothes, because yeah. we know that that won't work. Yeah. So it's trying to work out how we deliver that value to uh, wearers that gives them that self-esteem, that self-identity, but do it in a way that has a, 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 a reduced footprint. I mean, I think that there is, I hesitate, am I gonna be in trouble for saying this, but I think there is a generation divide going on on this because you know I can say this and I'm sure Jill will be the same and I'm sure you'll be the same like you know having been completely obsessed with clothes and image and what I look like when I was younger I'm still pretty a bit obsessed with it but as you get older you get more comfortable in what your own style is don't you so as you, as we we kind of as we get older we know this is what suits me and I can still maintain what I think is my style without feeling the pressure of, of, if you like, of media, of the herd, to have the latest stuff. So it's very easy for me to sit here and think, oh, you know, I always look all right. And uh, last year I pledged not to buy any new, new clothes, despite the fact that I do have quite a lot of clothes and I like getting clothes, but they all came from charity shops. Now, it, it's easy for me to do that because I know what suits me and I know what I'm okay with and I'm confident with that. But what we do know is that when you're younger, you know, psychologists have borne this out, haven't they? When you're younger, your brain is more susceptible to peer pressure. That, that actually takes up a bigger part of your brain. It is more important. So in some ways, it makes me think that, that some of the arguments and the discussions have to be kind of quite different for younger people than maybe they do need to be for those of us who are more comfortable to make those choices and still feel okay. About yeah, and, and, it, and it, it, it starts from that point, as I say, in terms of, you know, what, what job does fashion do? And, 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 you know, the idea of self-esteem and self-identity. And by the way, you know, we, we don't have, as individuals, one identity. We tend to have a series of different personas that, that, we, that we live through. So, you know, if you're going for a job interview or, importantly, if you're going on a date, it, you know, you're, you're, the choice of clothing you make is very, very different. So we, so we run these different personas and for these different personas, we tend to have um, you know, we'll have maybe a different hairstyle, different clothes, because we're communicating different things. And um, what, what's interesting is, Peg, I think you're absolutely right. There is there is this there is this age um, or generational difference. But what we are seeing from a sustainability point of view, in terms of trying to predict whether people are going to be green or not green, the usual demographics that work off don't work. And we, 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 we tend to find that actually, even though young people are much more aware of sustainability, they're less likely to actually engage in terms of their behaviour than those who are of an older generation. And, and we're also seeing as well some role reversal going on here that, you know, older people actually are starting to say, well, I, I want to change what I look like and what I'm saying about myself. So the, the usual demographics are, are shifting hugely now. I, I, and of course, you know, we, we, have, we can't, I guess, go through the call without talking about the impact of COVID. Mm -hmm. we, we have no idea what COVID is going to do to people's um, long term sort of view of fashion. But what's re really interesting, and I, I know it's a bit of a funny thing to say about COVID, which is such a serious, terrible thing that's happened. But what we are seeing with COVID is the fashion for elasticated waists has become <laughs> huge yes. in relationship to other things. So. 
the, 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 that, that starting point for the research that we do is to say, what, does, what, what job does fashion do? But we also talk about the fact that fashion is about culture and culture is not just about um, what colour our clothes are. Culture um, can stretch to the point, for example, the Chancellor of the Exchequer wants us to go out and buy things. That's a cultural thing. The UK economy is driven by shopping. Mm. So the Chancellor of the Exchequer doesn't want us to stop buying. Um, you know, so, so we've got all these cultural things that are going on and we have to take that into account when we're come, trying to come up with solutions. We need to work out, and this is the really hard thing, um, that you know, we're trying to do with, with average. So, well, how do we deliver self-esteem, self-identity, that opportunity to communicate, but do it without compromising the ability of uh, workers in places like India, Pakistan, Vietnam, Cambodia, who are earning um, from from working in uh, cotton fields or garment factories, and at the same time try and support the the, the economic model in the UK. There, there are they were about a million people who were employed in clothing retail a few years ago. That's changed dramatically. So this is the complexity of what we're trying to work with. And, and uh, you know, you, you do look at it and you think, well, this is how can we navigate our way through this? And we have to find that path by taking that step back and saying this is cultural rather than just a, you know, a single issue around the industry. And I would say as well, we have to find a way to do those things that also recognises the importance of aestheticism. In, in terms of that people want things that they feel look nice. And we all, you know, well, most of us do want to feel like we look comfortable and we look nice. And, you know, I mean, I know I'm an old hippie who was kind of brought up on the arts and craft movement, you know, own nothing that is neither both functional and beautiful, you know, and, um, and, and that, that aspect of clothes, is is important isn't it Jill I mean Jill you've got a young daughter as well I know so you're in your house you must be having a lot of these conversations yeah and it's a conflict and it's a really interesting thing we were talking as a team at Zero Waste Leeds last week about the age differences and and your values and so this is an interesting thing so so as a, a you know I'm 49 I'm, I'm not needing to go out on a Friday night to find myself a boyfriend for a long time. You know, so, so I, I, I can I, I can apply my values in wanting to be more sustainable. I can easily apply those to my clothing choices because it's just, it's just very easy for me to do that. But my 15 year old daughter who does understand um, about she you know she is concerned about the environment, but and and she does have those underlying values. But we were talking earlier, weren't we, Mark, about how your priority, so you, you sort of, the value might be here, but then your actual priority is to look good and, mm. and for your friends to see that you're looking good. So one of the things there is how could, how can the industry help that drive that change? Because if the, if the industry at the moment presents to, to Leah a load of online opportunities to buy really cheap disposable clothing, and so that's, you know, she, so she does some of that. But how can the industry adapt to almost um, force values further up that priority for us all? And how does the industry, Mark, I'm gonna come back to you, how does the industry do that in a way that also recognizes that not everybody has the money to buy expensive clothes? Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, that, that, that's a really important thing. And I know some of my sort of the, the wider academic circles talk about the fact that, you know, clothing should be more expensive um, to reflect the value of clothing. Value. Um, and, and more expensive clothing would, would also mean by default that it's more sustainable. And, you know, we have to break down some myths there. And, and the first, the, the, the really big issue is, is the, this idea that for, for many years, the really positive thing about the fashion industry, it, it's been open to virtually everyone. It hasn't been capped by how much money you earn. So we could see a swing back to the, you know, the, 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 the position where you, you could only engage in fashion if you were royalty, um, you know, going back, you know, several hundred years. So we, do, we don't want to go that way. That, 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 that's, um, you know, too much of an impingement on, on people's um, ability for, for, you know, creating their self-identity. What's really interesting about what the, what the industry is doing, uh, and, and I, 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 I've made the mistake that I always tell my students all about, you know, we, we say the industry, but actually the industry is made up of lots of different organisations. There are some what I call responsible brands and retailers who are working really hard 
to deliver to their customers this idea of, of fashionable clothing at a good value proposition, but doing it in a way that is better for the environment and better for workers in the supply chain. So there are brands who are using um, cotton that's come from more sustainable sources. There are brands who are really um, making use of, of, of huge amounts of, of recycled polyester, for example, which has a lower um, carbon footprint. They're doing things within the supply chain to reduce their water use. And is that all real? That's not, that's not greenwashing. Well, th there's a couple of initiatives I'm involved in where, where the, the assessment or the, the, the checking that is done is, is done by a third party. Mm. So that, you know, they're not connected. So, I, but it's an important point to raise, Peg, you know, that there, there, there is a history of people going out there and saying, we're doing some wonderful things. And then when you dig down deep, you realise they're doing nothing different to what they were doing before. They've just rebranded it. So, the, the, but there are, uh, and, and, and this, you know, if, if, if someone was to say to me, what, what should a consumer of fashion do? Yeah. In terms of trying let's, and... let's get onto that because we're kind of coming up towards our... Yeah. So the, 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 the important thing is, is, is um, I would say, is do your research. Now, uh, and what I mean by that is, if, if you shop with a certain brand, go onto their website, look, see what they're talking about. Are they, are they talking about sustainability? If they're not, then we have to make the assumption that they're doing nothing. But if they are doing something, if they are saying we're doing X, Y, and Z, let's say that they're, they're doing, you know, they're using sustainable cotton, Look for the detail. Are they actually doing anything? You know, are, are they connected to any of these organisations, these third party organisations that we've talked about? So is it BCI cotton? Is it organic cotton? Is it fair trade? Are they also part of initiatives like the um, Sustainable Clothing Action Plan, SCAP? Um, so do your research. Does your brand say the right things? And if they are saying the right things, then we can sort of assume that they're doing more than those brands who are saying nothing. Um, and it's a bit of a rule of thumb. There are exceptions to that, because I know there are some brands who are doing some wonderful things, but say nothing about it at all. So that's the first thing. Your choices about where you buy and what you buy, do the research first. And it doesn't take that long. And if you're interested in sustainability, actually, you can learn something from doing that. Is it too simplistic to say if a T-shirt's $3.99, it's probably not sustainable? Absolutely. So, so uh, one of the myths that we, we, we try to bust here at Leeds, so, so we, my, I, we almost see our job as myth busting some of these things. So we, we, did, a, we did a really, uh, we did two exercises, two, two projects looking at denim jeans and looking at black t-shirts. And the output of those, the, the, those, those projects that we did was that there is no correlation between the price of a garment that you pay in the stores and the durability or the quality of that product. We, we bought a black T-shirt that was retailing at 80 pounds. It was so bad when we tested it. We had to test it again because we couldn't believe it was so bad. And when we tested a, a T-shirt that was five pounds, it was fantastic. Equally with, with denim jeans, 120 pound pair of denim jeans. Well, actually lasted half as long as a 14 pound pair of jeans. So there, there, there is no connection between durability. Durability is an important part of this conversation mm -hmm. about fashion. But also, just because something's more expensive, there is no guarantee that that is more um, uh, sustainable in terms of you know, its environmental or social um, um, impacts. We, we know that one luxury brand um, who talks about their, their product being made in artisan factories in Italy, we know that some of those factories have at some point, and if not still now, are run by the mafia so th th there are th there are all challenges here so you know it, you can't make unfortunately these uh, you know broad brush statements about it's cheap therefore it's not good um uh, or it's more expensive therefore it, it, it's green and that what is about, uh, um mark the, the end of life of our clothing so we talked about that before now on on our um zero waste leads website people will find um a map of all the textile banks across the city, of which there are many. There will, you know, there's one near you. So, uh, and we, and one of the things that we try and do all the time is encourage people not to throw textiles in the bin. So, what about the the end of life? And, and we were talking earlier about it, there being a bit of a, a circularity within West Yorkshire as well of the opportunities to turn this clothing into something else. Yeah. So, so, so West Yorkshire is a really nice place to be talking about fashion and textiles. We've got fabric mills in West Yorkshire producing some of the most luxurious fabrics in the world. There are some garment factories still still left in West Yorkshire. But interestingly, as you say, 
um, when, when clothing comes to, to the end of its life, when you decide that you're going to throw that away, where does it go to? Well, if you make the right choices, it can be um, reused or recycled. And within West Yorkshire, historically, um, Dewsbury, Huddersfield, Batley, even Ossets, just outside Wakefield, have had um, really strong industries that take old textiles um, and, and, do, and do something good with them in terms of either um, reusing them or reselling them as clothes or recycling them. And there is still a very strong um, uh, industry around uh, reuse and recycling in this region. And, uh, and it's so strong that we get people from, you know, politicians and, and experts traveling from all over the UK to uh, West Yorkshire to see how it's actually done. And if you dispose of your garment in the right way, if you give it to a, 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 um, a responsible re, uh, a charity, or even take it back to a retailer, a lot of retailers are doing these take back schemes, 70% of the stuff that comes back could be reused as clothing here, either here in the UK or as exported to, to overseas markets. And even if it's not reused as clothing, it can be recycled. So there are some really interesting recycling organizations in, in, in West Yorkshire that turn it into fillings for mattresses, for example. Um, but if you decide that your clothing comes to the end of life and you just chuck it in the bin, it will automatically uh, go through that, that, that normal process and, and uh, either end up in landfill or, or go to incineration. So the, the challenge here is, is um, for, for consumers to say, well, I, I no longer need that garment. What do I do with it? You can eBay it. You can give it to your, your younger brother, younger sister. You can um, do that peer, peer sharing. You can, you can share it through your swap campaigns or you can donate it to charity or, 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 or give it to, or take it back to, to your local store. So m and for example, do take back uh, and others do as well. And those, those stores that take, take those garments back tend to um, link up with, with um, charities that are really good at recycling. So Oxfam based in Batley, their national center is in Batley um, and they're processing hundreds of tons of, of, of garment waste. So there are good things that we can do with our choices. I have yeah, to add right. that that's there because uh, when you said about you'd give it to your brother and sister, I'm the youngest of nine. So no more. I don't think I ever had any new clothes. In fact, I can remember wearing my brother's underpants. Yeah. You know, they, oh. hey. <laughs> Scarred for life. Yeah. So so many things that we as individuals could do. And, and, and it, I think this discussion has really showed that our clo clothing choices from what we choose to buy, how we look after it, how we dispose of it really matter. But are there things, Mark, talking of Leeds Fashion Futures, are there things coming on the horizon, innovations, you know, new ways of being sustainable, what's coming? So the, the, there's lots of work looking at the raw materials we use. So we know raw materials play a really big part in what we do with, with, with clothing. So um, there, there are new raw materials that people are trying to bring through um, to see whether they are more sustainable. But actually, probably more important, that there are new ways of producing the raw, the raw materials that we all love and use now. So cotton, for example, um, has a very bad press, and, and in some ways, rightly so. But there are new ways of growing cotton that minimise the impact and on the environment, but increase biodiversity, and at the same time will still support those, those subsistence workers in places like East Africa, West Africa, um, India and Pakistan. So that doesn't sound you know, really sexy in, in many ways, but it has real positive attitude, a real positive approach in terms of reducing the environmental impact, but also supporting um, local communities. We're also seeing some very significant changes in terms of technology. So, for example, the, the application of colour to clothing. So, um, bizarrely, we're all wearing very dark coloured clothes. And by the way, the colour of a garment can have an impact on how sustainable it is. Mm. But what we're looking at here is, is um, the technology that, that is used to apply colour. It ten, tended to be very, very uh, water intensive and very carbon intensive. We're looking at ways of dyeing fabrics now, the, the application of colour, using very, very low temperatures and also um, eliminating water. And um, so that there are things going on there. Um, the, the real big holy grail that everyone's really trying very hard to work on is can we take old clothes, put them through some sort of process where we can extract that raw material and then close the loop, take that raw material, then make new clothes from it. Now, there are little hot spots. 
There's some really old technology in Prato in Italy, for example, where they can do this with cashmere and wool and have been doing it for 300 years. There's some cutting edge technology looking at how we can recycle 100% polyester garments. But there's still a long way to go on this one, but you know, th there is a lot of effort being put into this. Government are talking about it. The industry is talking about it. The global industry is talking about it. Are they, so are they talking about it fast enough for you, from your perspective, Mark? Or is the industry itself being a bit slow? Do they need more of a push to make this happen? I, I think that this, I, I'm, I'm a, a tree hugging, sandal wearing sort of geek for, for sustainability. And none of this is fast enough. You know, whether it's fashion, whether it's the automotive industry, none of this is fast enough. We are in a crisis. So the answer to that is no one's moving fast enough. Um, but I would add some nuance to that. As I say, there are some brands who are working really hard um, on this, in, in spite of the, the significant um, pressures that the, the, the COVID, in, uh, COVID um, uh, pandemic has had on the, 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 the industry. There are um, a number of organisations who are working really hard. There are a number of international, sorry, there are a number of governments around the world who are also working quite hard. Um, I'm not sure whether the UK government is included in that, but there are things happening. Um, it's not fast enough and it's not across the board. Not everyone is doing it. So there are lots of brands in the UK. Is it on the agenda at the COP? So, because obviously we've got the COP coming to Britain next year, it was supposed to be here last year, but uh, coming to assuming it, you know, it does actually happen. In terms I, of the, the international agreements, is the clothing industry right up there in the same way that, say, mining is? I, I don't know, to be honest with you, Peg, and, right. and, and, I, and I'd be, uh, I'm going to put myself on the line here a little bit and would suggest that most politicians don't know enough about fashion, the impacts and the complexity to, to really understand it. Um, but, but I do know that uh, actually what, what's really interesting is the, the key players within the industry have said, we're not waiting for government anymore. We're, we're making it happen. And, and you know, some, some of your viewers might be surprised by this, but that there are a number of brands and retailers who are lobbying government to say, you need to, in, you need to strengthen up legislation to help us make fashion more sustainable. So that, that, you know, for me, and, and having sat in some of those meetings, it's really interesting that the industry is pushing our government harder. Um, but saying that, there's lots of other brands, lots of other organisations that are doing nothing around this area. And those guys need to be pulled out. They need to be um, uh, challenged on these things. And, and we all, I, I, just, I guess almost to finish now, as, as individuals, we, we all have the opportunity to do that. We can support those brands who are doing the right thing by buying from them and boycotting those who are not doing the right thing. We can write to those brands and say to the chief executive, what are you doing about it? Are you it? able to tell us who some of those brands are? Or I, it, It's a... Uh, because I know it, I'm hesitating to ask you that because I yeah, know... Well, well listen, the, the, the answer to that is um, go out and do some research. Um, okay. So if you want to know, don't take my word for it. Go and look at the, um, the SCAP agreement, for example. Go and look at um, Better Cotton Initiative and see which members are involved in that. Go and look at the Soil Association and Organic Cotton. And these are people who do lots of research and they will tell you what's going on. Look at WWF, um, look at uh, Greenpeace. There's lots of organisations who are focusing on these things and, and you, can, you can find a lot of stuff out from, from those. But as I say, do, do also look at the brands themselves. You know, if they're talking about stuff, if they make commitments, if they set targets, they generally are, are trying to achieve those things. And Jill, but, just to finish off, can you tell us some of the stuff that's happening in Leeds? Because I know there's so much going on through the Leeds Future, Fashion Futures campaign. Yeah, so we do, you know, we, we're talking about our textile history and heritage and, and what we can learn from looking back to, to look forward. And we're talking about um, developing, people developing their skills um, and, and putting out their, what resources um, people can access and also valuing clothes. But I think, it's really interesting, isn't it, that a lot of what's happening in terms of sustainability and fashion will be driven because it's us as consumers who are demanding some of that. But what Mark's saying is it's happening too slow. And I think so something really good to end on, perhaps, is that is not to underestimate um, our what we can do as individuals and also how we can influence each other. That's what we try and do through Zero Waste Leads is people respond really well to hints and tips, things that other people like them are doing, and then adopt those new ways of, of behaving. So I do think 
there's a lot to be said for the for the power of, of us as individuals in, in the fashion industry. Absolutely, and what a great a great place to end. And and even little things as little as putting your hoodies out on the on the washing line, uh, just going through some of those things, not washing your clothes as much. Think about when you buy something. Do you really need to buy it, or have you got have you got some? It's a little story. I found a jumper. I found a top in my cupboard the other day. Didn't even know I had it. Do you know what I mean? I was there. You go. Of, a wardrobe. Oh, start with a wardrobe order. Yeah. And so I, mean, I think, I think it was you put on the other day, the most sustainable piece of clothing you have got is the one you already own. Exactly. <laughs> did, did, did you know that there's, that there's uh, it's been estimated there is £40 billion worth of clothing sitting in a wardrobe somewhere in oh, yeah. the UK. I, I think it's just outside Barnsley. I was going to know, actually, <laughs> most of it's in my, in my <laughs> flat, to be honest now. <laughs> but yeah. that, 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 that's one of the big challenges here, that, you know, we, we all do the same thing. We buy lots of clothing. And, and then just goes further and further back into the wardrobe. So um, I, I definitely endorse that wardrobe order. You never know. You might find my, some of my wardrobe goes back 30 years. So I found something that's back in fashion now. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> If you keep going, you'll probably find some of my brother's underpants as well. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, other things, think about what you're buying. Do you really need to buy it? Uh, think about how you care. And when it gets to the end of the life of the clothing, think about, is it possible to turn it into something else yourself? If not, there are plenty of people around in Leeds, actually, who might be able to turn it into something for you and uh, go to the Zero Waste Leeds website and look at the Leeds Fashion Future stuff because you are doing much more to link up those people. If you absolutely can't do anything with it, don't put it in the bin. Just don't put it in the bin. Put it in a, fab a textile recycling box, take it to if it's still wearable, take it to a charity shop. Um, and especially school uniforms, there's a massive school uniform exchange going on. Yeah, do you know what? That, that's been Zero one of Waste the great Leeds. successes. When you talk about um, the value of clothing in, in the back of wardrobes and covers and drawers. So when we put the call out to say that we were looking at setting up the Leeds School Uniform Exchange, there are tens of thousands of items of school uniform in the back of people's covers and drawers that the kids have grown out of. They don't know what to do with it. Much of it is in my garage. I'm not joking. It's full <laughs> to the rafters. There's mountains of this stuff. And that's what we're going to try and encourage more and more people to, take, to, to choose second-hand school uniform as a first choice, particularly in a COVID pandemic when most of it's hardly been worn for a year. Yes. So yes. it's a great opportunity to, uh, to choose second-hand. Don't buy new. Don't, don't, don't buy new. new. There's no need to do that. And then just also one, one other thing. I mean, I think this is a kind of good sign of, of how things have changed. So 10 years ago, I embarked on a massive diet, right? And I did this diet that you lose weight really quickly on. And I lost half my body weight. And I literally went from a size 22 to a size 10. Uh, just to boast, I am still a size 12 all these years later. But there we go. Just, just to throw that one in. A um, little bit tight on the 12th, but you know. Anyway, but uh, when we did that, we didn't share clothes. I mean, and that is one of the things. But these days, I don't think you'd do that. I don't think you would have a place where loads of people were going where literally the weight was just dropping off us without us sharing clothes. And I must have looked like a scarecrow for most of that time because I was determined I wasn't buying clothes as I went down. I only bought one middle set and I used to have them hauled up with pins and all sorts to get me through and um, so of course at this time of year it is diet time so if you go to a slimming club or a diet club again get a clothes exchange Good idea. Yeah, especially when people are in the journey you know there's no need to because and and the fact that we're all at home all the time at the moment as well um so i know the stories of the queues outside clothes shops and stuff in Leeds when they open back up again really do think you know even when we come out of lockdown we're still probably going to be at home a lot of the time do we really need all those new clothes really yeah, exactly. um so i think that probably gets us towards the end doesn't it i know mark there could be loads loads more we talk about but that very that, that simple message actually this is one of the things where what we do on our day-to-day -day lives really does make a difference and really does change it um, and we really are part of it, or we can really be part of the solution. So um, I think we'll finish it there. But Jill, people can follow Leeds Fashion Futures on all the social media channels. 
Yes, and Zero Waste Leeds. We've got plenty of fashion stuff on Zero Waste Leeds and check out our website for things and, our, and Leeds School Uniform Exchange as well. Yeah, across the board. Yeah. And, and can I just make one quick plug as well? Mm. That uh, oh. University of Leeds is, is going to be creating a new uh, sustainable fashion degree course uh, mm. next year. So anybody okay. that you know is, is interested in doing um, studying sustainable fashion, um, do, do look out for the launch of that. And what we're doing with that course is, is building in all of the things that we've talked about today and and plenty more over a three-year period. So uh, if you want to listen to me for three years, then get yourself signed up to that. Well, what more could anybody want? Frankly, <laughs> what more could anyone want? Thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for those who've joined us. We didn't have any questions or comments on Facebook. That's obviously because we were just answering anything as we went along, but uh, it's been good to have people's company. And I know loads more people will watch this when we, we put it out on Facebook. So thanks, everyone. Sorry we were a bit late this morning. Of course, there's going to be loads more lives coming up through Zero waste leads and these fashion futures so keep an eye on the facebook page to be notified of the live events thank you very much everybody lovely thank you thank you